Hello, how are you? Good, good.、Um, thank you so much for joining us.、Uh, my name is、uh, Yacha Wang. I'm a senior researcher for Human Rights Watch.、Um, joining me today is Craig Foster, a nominee for the best dressed man in Australia.、Uh. But, today, <laughs> but we're not talking about fashion. We're talking about football and human rights,、um, sports and human rights.、Uh, Thank you for that. The former captain of the Australian national football team.、Uh, he is also a global advocate for human rights. Uh, uh, you know, as we all know, that、uh, Craig campaigned for the release of、uh, Hakim, who was in a jail in Thailand.、Uh, you know, he's a football player. And among the many boards that Craig sits on, we're very honored to have him on our Australia committee.、Uh, Today we're going to focus on the Beijing 2022 Winter, Winter Olympics.、Um, last month, Craig published an op-ed on the Sydney Morning Post.、Uh, what's the、uh, Sydney Morning Herald titled? Beijing 2022 is a celebration of crimes against humanity. In the op-ed, you said, Craig, that Australia government should boy should start a diplomatic boycott of the. Winter Beijing 2022 Olympic, which the government did. So, congratulations! Tell us how do you feel about this? Well, I'm pleased that Australia, among other governments around the world, are raising the voice, taking the opportunity to、uh, put pressure on、uh, China in relation to their systemic oppression,、uh, human rights abuse,、uh, religious erasure,、uh, sterilisation, all of these horrible treatment of many. Turkic minorities, actually, particularly、uh, the Uyghurs in Xinjiang. It's very, very important that Australia and other countries speak up. I must say, though, you know, in that piece, the point I made,、uh, among others, was firstly that sport is inconsistent with crimes against humanity. I mean, you know, that, that's just that's just the bottom line. So, sport can no longer say that. Well, we just go into these countries and we're completely neutral, and you know all we do is go throw balls, or in Winter Olympics case, just ski down a few mountains. And whatever happening in that country has really got nothing to do with us whatsoever. So that is that is discredited that view. It it has been a view for a very long time, and sport has sold this very successfully,、uh, but no longer, for, and that's for a variety of reasons.、Uh, fans aren't fans are not accepting it anymore. Uh, 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 athletes are not accepting it anymore, which is really important. And I would like to see more action from Olympians themselves, because professional athletes right around the world are making huge noise now on a range of a whole range of、uh, social and particularly human rights issues, racial equality, and all these other things. So I'm pleased that that's happened. But the point I made as well was that、uh, just the government. Uh, the government of Australia and other countries and the athletes have been placed by the IOC in an invidious position, and so rather than just diplomatic boycott and then athletes go and compete and everyone moves on, the point I'm making is question the IOC. It's time for the world to question the IOC in the same way that we need FIFA to be questioned also、uh, in relation to Qatar and other things. IOC have put the governors of the Olympics have put the athletes. Put sport itself, put the so-called principles of Olympism,、uh, put people who love sport like myself,、uh, put all the fans around the world, put the、uh, corporate sponsors, and put the governments in this position, where you're asking us to look away from from what some people call genocide, what at Human Rights Watch,、uh, you know, you call crimes against humanity, and that should never have to happen. So rather than just respond to that. And say, well, we'll we'll boycott, or an athlete feels strongly one might not go, one might go and protest courageously. That's not enough. All of us need to now look and say, well, how did this occur? On what basis did sport decide that it has nothing to do with a society that sustains it, promotes it, and finances it? It's no longer enough. Well, I mean, you said that so, you know the idea that、uh, sports can stay neutral, that we don't want to touch politics. It's none of our business. You said this, you know, idea has been rejected, but that's still the idea of the IOC. IOC has repeatedly said, you know, we wanted to stay political neut- neutral. How do you respond to this entity who keeps saying this? Look, it's really simple, and、uh, I think twenty twenty two. Uh, is a moment is a year of reckoning for global sport because we have this year both Beijing and we have the Qatar、uh, FIFA World Cup. 
those are two really important moments for people to step back and say, okay, what is acceptable for us in sport here now? Like this, you know, what they've sold, the package they've sold at the same time that they've developed this social license by saying, well, we, we are uh, part of, uh, you know, solidarity, you know, these principles uh, so-called of Olympism, uh, you know, non-discrimination, uh, you know, all of these things, um, uh, equality, gender equality and things. At the same time that you're selling that, you're now going into countries where and with the, the showcase events, you're lending this brand, you're lending the brands of the athletes, who ultimately is what it's all about. The athletes are going there. They are uh, representing their countries and they're enabling a place like China in this instance to burnish its image, to promote its image around the world. So sport is political. It is not neutrality. And what people need to understand is the only neutrality is human rights. So by uh, IOC saying to China, we're completely comfortable with crimes against humanity because we just want to come in and you know bring a couple of skis and, and some pucks, um, and we think that's fine, that's a political statement. That is a political statement supporting... The, the views of the CCP as they currently stand, because that's the CCP's view. So you are siding with uh, uh, countries, you're siding with parties, you're siding with ideologies, uh, and allowing them to promote themselves through us, through sport. That in itself is a partisan, that is political, that is complicity, uh, and that needs to stop. Human rights, however, are the real neutrality because what we're saying is that these should exist for everyone around the world and we're not influenced by what China thinks or what Australia thinks because we also have a horrible record on refugees and Indigenous Australians. Uh, and, you know, we need to keep, you know, of course, hold ourselves accountable. That's, that's vitally important. Um, or what Russia thinks or what Brazil thinks or what the, you know, the new government in the US thinks. That's, that's immaterial. Human rights exist as an objective set of principles that the world has agreed on, that every human being should be equal, should be treated equal, and should have really basic rights, whether that's to education or other things. That's neutrality. So when a sport says, oh, no, we'll come there, we'll take all the money, and we'll keep our mouths shut, we won't say anything about people being severely harmed in the millions in Xinjiang, that is in itself deeply political and deeply wrong. I mean, you mentioned the word money. I think that's the key. You know, those sports organizations, they go to China because, you know, the market is huge. That's why they're there, despite all the human rights violations going on. But, uh, you know, we see that uh, in the Peng Shui case, who's the tennis, Chinese tennis player who alleged sexual assault against a very high level official and he has been since been silenced and in response to that you know the women's uh, tennis association said human rights is above business it's about profits you know if you treat a tennis asset like this we are not going to play in your country anymore and they just took this stance and do you feel encouraged by this, you know, organization taking this stand? Uh, do you think other organizations could possibly follow suit? I think it's wonderful what WTA have done, and that would be very difficult to argue against from anyone in the world. What they've said is we care about the basic rights of people, uh, and particularly tennis players, because that's within our purview. That's, we have a responsibility to all of the players who play our game, and therefore... There's certain standards of uh, treatment of each of our players that we have as a minimum expectation under their basic human rights, and that is in every country. Now, in the ideal world, it, any country who contravenes those basic rights of people that the WTA are responsible for are called out in a similar fashion. The problem is, of course, that sport uh, has become endemically... Uh, um, uh, kind of uh, uh, colluding with uh, countries uh, and organisations uh, who offer the most money. You know, take, for instance, uh, the fact in, in football now, you know, we have countries with egregious human rights records actually owning football clubs and owning broadcast rights uh, and, and having very significant 
uh, uh, governance, um, interventions, uh, involvement, um, and, uh, and really influencing how the game is governed. All of those things, I think, in 2022, I hope it's time to say enough. That's not what sport is about. In fact, sport, it's anathema to sport. So let's take, for example, there. So what the WTA did was incredibly important because they made a statement and in so doing, they showed just how weak both FIFA and IOC are. It's like really simple, right? Okay. That's what you guys could be doing all the time. And what I always say to people, just imagine the world, how it could be with the power of sport, how much we love it. If sport actually pushed back and believed in the concept of human rights, what sort of world would we have? What sort of world if in 1968, if, uh, you know, Carlos and Smith and Norman from Australia uh, with a black power salute, what sort of world would we have now if uh, the IOC at that time in the Mexico 68 Olympics said, we love that, we love what you're doing, because that's consistent with our principles of Olympism. Of course it is. It's about racial equality. It's about non-discrimination. It's about the basic principles that they purport to abide by. Those guys should have been uh, applauded. They should have been venerated. They should have been held up as exactly what sport is about and what Olympism is about. And I must say the athletes believe in this, but they have to take more ownership and responsibility of it. And so do we in football around the world. We have to, players, former players, must take more ownership of the way that our sports are governed. It's not good enough anymore to rely on these people, make these decisions. Uh, you know, take, for instance, uh, the Qatar World Cup. There's somewhere up to at least 6,500 people who've died building the stadia. So for every goal that's scored in that World Cup in no this November, there's literally um, tens, if not hundreds, of people who died for that goal. So every time we celebrate, uh, you know, we're, we're, there's, there's, there's blood behind it. That can't be right for sport. It's time that we make a change, and I hope this year is the one. The same applies in China. So they say, well, what does Xinjiang and Uyghurs have to do with Olympics? Well, we just go and play over here and we compete, and, and these people are up here. Well, firstly, uh, as they said during apartheid, uh, as was said in South Africa, there's no normal sport in an abnormal society. So when crimes against humanity are being perpetrated, it's not possible for people to just go on and pretend that it's not happening. There has to be a threshold where we say in sport, that's just too much. We can't, we can't lend our brand. We can't lend our promotion to this country while you're doing this to anyone, let alone reportedly a couple of million people. Right? But the other thing about it is it goes fundamentally to the, again, I say so-called purported principles of Olympism because athletes believe in it. I believe the governors of the Olympics don't even know what they mean. Uh, what about non-discrimination? What about the Uyghur athletes who might have had an opportunity to compete? What about the, the, the Uyghur kids, you know, five years ago, four years ago, who might have been able to, uh, you know, play or, or compete in this Beijing Games in only one month's time? Well, isn't that discrimination? What about them? Don't they matter? So if you have the principle of non-discrimination on any grounds, that goes to the very heart of discrimination, what is happening to the Uyghur people. And there are athletes in that area, in northwest China, Xinjiang, who would have dreamt of competing next month in Beijing. And they have been denied the opportunity, they've been denied the right, and they have been severely oppressed. That is not sport. Sport should not participate in that. And it's time, like the WTA, that we all push back and said, no, we need to have a look at the fundamental basis of what we're prepared to, uh, to collude with, what we're, you know, on what basis are we prepared to go around the world and, and bring these um, incredible athletes and promote a country to the world. At what stage do we say, well, you don't have the opportunity to do that. And I think given what China's doing to Uyghurs, the, the, then the answer is very clear, uh, that they have ex vastly exceeded that threshold. I mean, you said, uh, you know, athletes should take ownership of the sports and they are fed up with how things are structured currently. I mean, we all know that it's not only the athletes, or not only the IOC, it's all business, the big brands, you know, when you see in the stadium, you can all see the brands behind. What do you think of the business role in this? 
I mean, they're usually multinational companies. They make a lot of profit from you know, themselves at the game. So we, we should say firstly that in next month's Olympics, um, investigators in relation to slave labour and the production of all of the sportswear of so many countries around the world uh, have not been able to get into Xinjiang. And therefore, uh, it's highly likely, and last year there were reports about the Australian Olympic team, um, their apparel makers, uh, using labour, slave labour in Xinjiang. So it's highly likely people will be running around in their new gear for their country competing, winning gold medals with garments made by slave labour from people who have, uh, are suffering egregious human rights abuse. That already is disgusting. Secondly, um, history shows that uh, I would say the majority of companies um, are prepared to be silent, are more than prepared to be complicit when sport moves around the, way, the world in the way that it does now. Uh, however, it comes down to the athletes and the fans to put pressure on the sponsors, to put pressure on the corporate partners to say, we don't support this anymore. We will withdraw uh, our economic support. We will, uh, you know, we will boycott your, uh, your companies. We will raise the alarm. We will let people of the world know that you are complicit in this. And every company uh, that is sponsoring the Beijing Olympics uh, is at this point complicit in maintaining silence in, ev well, perhaps not every, but every company that hasn't said anything, in maintaining silence in relation to what's going on in Xinjiang. And as you know, and, and many of your viewers will know, many of our listeners today, uh, is that the UN uh, rapporteurs on human rights abuse haven't been allowed into Xinjiang. So at the same time that the IOC is an independent, well, we say independent, independent observer of a political body, the UN, even at the same time that they say sport's not political, they engage in a political process. Even then, the UN uh, has been reluctant or failed to force the IOC to respect, embed and protect human rights. So I think that's farcical, farcical, that you can sit in that chamber and observe and be a part of the political process. And one of the most important things, one of the most important uh, 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 vehicles, frameworks ever developed by the UN is the human rights framework. And yet you can still say, oh, we have no responsibility to human rights. Forget about the values of sport. Forget about the ethics of sport. We talked about those earlier. I'm talking here about just the, the, the UNGPs, business and the guiding principles on business and human rights. The IOC is multi-billion dollar business. You have a responsibility to make sure that you don't, um, you don't collude with, you don't support, and you don't create human rights abuse. Uh, and you're certainly supporting it in your silence through what's happening in Beijing. And just finally on that point, one of the most important things of 2021 and earlier was uh, Black Lives Matter campaign they coined a term all around the world, which has become famous in every language. And I see we've got people on here from Chile and everywhere. Um, and that, that uh, term was silence is violence. It's a very, very important term because looking away from harm means that we are complicit. That is the reality. And we all need to take responsibility for that. That is precisely what the IOC is doing. Well, you mentioned what the IOC should do, what athletes should do, and you know, as consumers, as you know, sports lovers, what we should do. What do you think the you know the role the government can play, like the Australian government? I mean, the diplomatic boycott is the first step. What do you want it to see more from the government? Well, I think every government should be calling out um, the the human rights abuse, particularly of the Uyghurs. You know, through the UN chambers and and mechanisms that. Are existing and and Australia has done that to some degree. I'd like to see us be much more vociferous, uh, but the world needs to push back on this. You know, immediately. Um, you know, some friends of mine here in Australia, Australian Uyghurs. You know, I know I went to Parliament House with them last year, maybe even the year before, uh, and their uh, wives and children and parents and others were locked up. They had not heard from them for six, ten months, a year, uh, and you know the abuse is is absolutely horrendous. And as soon as they said something here in Australia, 
then their families were pulled back in again in Xinjiang. They were questioned. They were interned. You know, this pressure is constantly applied to those family members around the world where the tentacles go. So everyone needs to be very aware that what's going on there uh, is, is, um, is simply not acceptable. And the whole world needs to push back. And I'll say again, that includes sport. So the question I might pose to you and all of your listeners, why is sport immune? Why should sport be immune from uh, protecting people? Why should sport be immune from having to take responsibility for its silence when it's colluding with, you know, egregious human rights abuse? Why should sport not have to step up and speak out on, you know, the Paris Agreement and climate action? Why should sport not have to take responsibility for the harm it both causes and supports? Uh, there is no reason. It's been this package, this, this vision has been sold to the world, but it's false, it's fallacious, uh, and it's damaging. It's hugely damaging. So if you ask uh, black South Africans or coloured South Africans during the apartheid era how they felt about sport coming into the country and supporting white South Africa, supporting them by playing cricket, by playing rugby, by playing table tennis. And I might say the first international organisation that banned white South Africa, part I'd say that, was the International Table Tennis Federation, so well done to them. Uh, by playing football against them, by inviting them into competitions, by it, it provides legitimacy to that regime. That's what sport did. And so people said at that time, we need sport to, to raise the alarm. Because when people stand shoulder and shoulder and say and hold up banners that say respect before they go and compete in the Olympics or whatever the banners are, the Uyghurs see that. They say, well, there is no respect for us. But you're, you're, you're standing you know, side by side to the CCP and you're all holding the banner saying respect. It's, you, know, you need to say something or you need to do something. It's not good enough to come here anymore and just pretend that what's happening to us is not going on. Thank you so much, Craig, and I totally agree with you. You know, it's time to push up, and I hope this 2022 is the year that we start, you know, this momentum. Uh, thank you so much, Craig, for joining us today. And if you want to follow up on our you know, uh, Olympic work, uh, please go visit our website, hw.org. Thank you so much. <laughs>